Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here for another Severo Choa colloquium. And uh, thank you all. And of course, thanks to the speaker today, Sebastian Sanchez Sanchez. Uh, thank you very much for having accepted our, our invitation. Uh, Sebastian Sanchez is a professor at the Instituto de Astronomía of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, where he works since uh, 2013. He's currently head of the astronomy observations at the uh, uh, Institute of Astronomy in the UNAM. He holds a degree in physics uh, from the University of Salamanca and a PhD in astrophysics from the University of uh, Cantabria in 2001, after which he worked at La Palma Observatory and then at Calar Alto until 2010, where he was ICTS responsible and we, uh, where he had postdoctoral stays then at the Astrophysical Institute in Potsdam, Germany, the uh, Centro de Estudios de Física del Cosmos de Aragón, CEFCA, and uh, our own institute here, the Instituto de Astrofísica Andalucía, the IAA, in 2011-2012. He has supervised uh, or co-supervised a tenth of PhD thesis and a number of MCC Thesis and directly supervises uh, the research of a dozen postdoctoral researchers. He has a long track record of teaching activities, both at his university and also being invited to give master classes in different universities, for instance, University of Victoria in Canada, the Complutense de Madrid, the IPN in Aoi, or giving also international advanced schools, giving courses at, at those international advanced schools like the IAC Winter School, for instance, or the new Neon School. He has participated in over a dozen research projects, both national and international, encompassing both, I mean, all these basic science, the Khalifa and Edge, I'll just cite those being uh, PI, instrumental development, again, uh, CAFE, data analysis software and distribution, Pipe 3D, E3D, R3D, SDS7, uh, uh, E-Khalifa. He has contributed to about 600 publications, uh, among almost 400 of them in peer-reviewed journals, about 40 as first authors with 24,000 citations, citations, 3,000 of them as first uh, author with an H index of 90. In the last two years, he, has, he was ranked among the top 1,000 most cited physicists in the world being the most cited astronomer in Mexico. His work is focused on understanding the evolution of galaxies through the exploration of the specially resolved spectroscopic properties, pioneering the implementation of integral field spectroscopy techniques in this field. He concept conceptualized and provided a community with computational methods to reduce, visualize, and analyze the stellar population and the ionized gas. He was the first to propose the existence of local relationships between the surface mass density and the star formation rate, as well as the oxygen abundance. He was the PI of the uh, uh, international project Khalifa that you all may have heard about, the first large scale integral field spectroscopy survey of galaxies in the local universe, which involved more than 80 scientists from over 20 countries, resulting in over 100 publications in peer reviewed journals more than 50 conference uh, presentations, and the mentoring of uh, 20, about 25 PhD and MCC students. This has also led the groundwork for new largest IFS, so integral field spectroscopy service, such as Manga, Sami, or Amusing, of which he is a promoter and founding member. The relevance of his research and diverse has been recognized worldwide leading to regular invitation to participate in evaluation panels as the ERC, ESF, HST TAC, Mineco, CONICIT, CONICIT. To also organizing, the, uh, you've been invited to organize in uh, committees, scientific organizing committees for conference, on to deliver seminars and invited and, uh, and review talks, and also being invited by the annual review of astronomy astrophysics to commission a review paper, Sanchez, uh, the only author, uh, author 2020, which is in fact the subject of today's talk. Thank you very much, Sarah, for having accepted our invitation. It's a real pleasure to have you here, and the board is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for me to talk here. It's like uh, to came into uh, to my grandmother's house, you know? It's like my house uh, somehow. And then I came and things changed that I'm not aware of. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I feel totally at home uh, speaking here. So I really thank the organizers for inviting me. 
Um, the talk of, two of today, after hearing all these things, I feel a bit uh, <laughs> under pressure. Is about uh, uh, can be summarized in uh, basically these uh, two uh, plots here. Uh, here you will see these kind of plots on the talk uh, all, all the time. Here in the left uh, we have uh, a continuous map uh, um, uh, image created from uh, this galaxy, extracted from IFU data. That is the topic of today: interferometric spectroscopy. And this is a, a, a three-color map created with a GR and I uh, band from the MUSE data. Uh, so it's tracing the continuous emission that is uh, in general associated with a uh, stellar population. And this is the same galaxy seen through the eyes of uh, emission lines. So we have uh, a three color image again, but in here, oxygen three, it's blue, uh, H alpha is in green, and uh, uh, nitrogen is in red. And uh, basically it's like a spatial resolved diagnostic diagram. So the talk of today is how we can understand the spatial resolved properties of both the stellar populations and the emission lines in galaxies and the change of uh, the emission lines condition in these galaxies. Um, this talk uh, basically, um, it's, a, it's a companion of uh, two uh, review articles, the one that has been mentioned before, that was uh, invited to by the annual review of Astronomy in 2020. And uh, this complementary article that is everything that I wanted to include in here, but the journal said, well, this is starting to be too, too, too large. So it's like uh, what, uh, what uh, else uh, I could say about, and it didn't fit in the, in the side of uh, this review. Um, so the talk of today is about internal field spectroscopy. Uh, I'm not going to uh, describe in detail what internal field spectroscopy is. Just uh, to tell you for the new cameras, this is a technique that allows to sample a, con a continuous or almost continuous region uh, in the sky um, and obtain a, a spectra simultaneously uh, of all the points that have been sampled that we name as faxels uh, within a certain field of view. Uh, there are different techniques uh, to create uh, this interface spectroscopy that are summarized here, but as I told you, I'm not going to go into the detail because uh, uh, this will require more time than what we have. Uh, there are interval field units uh, almost everywhere in the big telescopes nowadays. So this is a few samples in the north. Pimas, of course, appealing to my hair here in uh, Cala Alto. Uh, the Wave, uh, the Wheeler Herschel, Megana, and GTC. Uh, of course, in the south, this is the King of the Crown, uh, Muse, with all uh, the different spectrographs. Uh, but there the were our previous ones, Symphony, Vimos. Uh, there are, of course, interval field units in the space. And the most uh, new ones are NewSpec and Miri that are in the uh, James Webb uh, telescope. So you will find IFUs everywhere, and you will find IFUs exploring galaxies uh, almost in any big telescope. So, of course, uh, the topic of today is not only having IFUs to explore galaxies, but explore massive number of galaxies to try to uh, uncover the patterns in the spatial disorder properties uh, of these objects. And to me and to this institute, I think it's uh, worth to highlight Khalifa, that was uh, one survey that uh, basically was vividly attached to the Institute of, Ast of Astrophysics in Andalusia for a long time. It, uh, it length officially for 2010, 2017, but there are people in the audience that uh, know that it uh, started uh, before, and uh, later on, if you want, uh, we can take a uh, uh, talk about some anecdotes. There are some pictures of meetings, and I want to highlight uh, some of my PhD students that were involved in this uh, survey. Um, what is uh, an integral field? Uh, sorry. Uh, what is an integral field spectroscopy galaxy survey? Uh, well, it's a survey on uh, uh, on galaxies using integral field spectroscopy. So the name says everything. Uh, it, of course, it has more or more pro properties than that. You're required to cover a large fraction of the optical extension of the galaxies to provide with really characteristic or integrated properties of the galaxies and spatial result to any uh, gastrocentric distance. Uh, the samples should be large and representative of uh, the uh, volume that you are sampling, because if not, you, then you don't have a representative uh, result uh, that uh, you can uh, uh, generalize uh, to a certain population in a certain volume. Uh, it, it may be able or should be able to cover or explore the stellar populations and the ionized gas and the kinematics. So all this together uh, gives you a bulk of information that uh, you can uh, then you need to digest and how, and then you need to process to understand 
o dar espacio al Bishop por continuar pegar así que el santo lo va a decir again is Khalifa I could have I have similar plots uh, for other surveys but uh, uh, it will be a bit overdoing so we have here the continuum emission and this is a, this is a map of a star formation uh, oh sorry the diagram the star formation rate versus the mass uh, for the uh, uh, Khalifa galaxies and in each uh, point we have an uh, overplot this uh, continuum image that I showed you before. And of course, you can see here in these uh, bluish uh, galaxies uh, are tracing the star forming main sequence. And here, these reddish ones are basically the retired galaxies. Uh, if you go to the initial line maps, uh, it's the same that I showed you before. So I'm not going to repeat uh, what the color means. Uh, these are the, the ones that have high uh, uh, ionized, uh, strong ionized uh, gas. And they are tracing again the star formation. So the, the, that's why it's greenish. Uh, because it's uh, H alpha is higher than the other uh, two emission lines. Um, and in here, you just don't see it very well, but there are some pinky points that uh, correspond to uh, galaxies with low intensity, where our ellipticals have uh, less ionized gas, and the emission is pinky because it's uh, nitrogen is higher um, than the other two emission lines. Um, another information you can get from this, uh, in, from this uh, data is the stellar spatial resolved stellar population, Properties in this uh, map uh, we plot the luminosity weight in the age and uh, and uh, there is an example of one galaxy in the center the ages are uh, older than in the outer part um, the galaxies that are uh, star forming and they are uh, along this star formation main uh, uh, star formation uh, um, uh, main sequence uh, are the ones that have a younger stellar population that are associated. Uh, with this star formation, of course, with the initiation that we see here, so everything is connected. And the ones that are in reddish here are the ones that have all the stellar population, of course. Uh, it's better to say not that they have all the stellar population because all, all of them have all the stellar populations. These galaxies here have lack of young stellar populations. They have, uh, they, are, they don't have uh, young uh, stars and that's uh, why they are reddish here and uh, in these colors and why, why they have the, uh, the luminosity way in ages uh, are older. Um, it, this is again connected uh, with the kinematics. This is the kinematic uh, of the gas. And uh, in here, you have the galaxies that usually are uh, rotating, are supported by rotation. And here, there are the galaxies that basically uh, are supported by, well, random uh, uh, emotions. That are not random motions, actually. It's a random distribution in the orbit. It would be a better, a better way to say. So, this is the, the kind of information. And to digest this, uh, this uh, huge amount of information, we require dedicated pipelines, like Py3D, or the data analysis pipeline in the case of Panga, Firefly, Picasso here, that was uh, created here in the house. Um, because uh, you cannot uh, digest uh, this uh, amount of spectra in the typical all way analysis of going spectra to spectra and analyze them. So there are different IFU surveys. Uh, this is just a brief uh, summary. I don't want to enter in detail. Uh, just to highlight that uh, uh, different surveys are focused in different uh, aspects. So Atlas 3, that was a pirate, uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, uh, sample this kind of gas. It was focused in elliptical. So this is just to highlight the resolution effects um, comparing with the same galaxy. And it was focused in the analysis of elliptical galaxies in a very narrow spectral range that is highlighted here. They publish a lot. They make a uh, a lot of impact just with this uh, narrow emission line and just focusing in the uh, first uh, effective radius uh, of, of, of galaxies and all the analytical galaxies. And afterwards, there were uh, Khalifa and the Manga, that is the one that have sampled the largest number of uh, galaxies, 10,000 galaxies. So for galaxies statistics, this is the, uh, the uh, survey that highlights more. Um, in the case of SAMI, they, sa they sample just the very center but with a very high spectral resolution. So for kinematics, SAMI is superior to the other uh, surveys. Um, Khalifa make a good compromise between a uh, number of galaxies. We sample of the order of uh, 1,000 galaxies. So it's uh, 10 times less uh, than Manga, but uh, we get uh, out of uh, uh, up to 2.5 to 3 effective radii in most of the galaxies. So we are the one that sample uh, and also with a better physical resolution than Manga. So we are the ones that make a comp the best compromise on uh, resolving galaxies and uh, galaxies statistics. Of course, uh, new surveys that are now the compilation of uh, a missing plus plus that is uh, now with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Muse uh, provide with a much better spatial resolution. But in the case of Muse, uh, you lack 
uh, this is the weather range covered by news in a the yellow, you lack of the blue part. So there are important information that is missing here. This plot is only shown here just to tell you that it's a different survey, may provide different information, and you can end up with different conclusions because they see the galaxies in different ways. So all the surveys are very complementary, and uh, it's important to put together all the surveys to really understand what's going on with galaxies. Um, so, and this is what uh, we did in this uh, uh, review. Then we make a collection of all the different surveys and we selected two samples, one that maximized the number of galaxies, so all the galaxies that fulfill a certain quality criteria. Uh, they were of the order 8,000 galaxies. At the moment, Manga had, uh, did, had still not finished uh, to cover all the, all the galaxies, so that was the largest uh, compilation of a few data to, uh, to date. Um, and then we make uh, some kind of a golden sample that they basically have the best uh, uh, spatial resolution and the best uh, 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 sampling in terms of the uh, galaxy centric distance. Um, and with that, is where, where, uh, with this data, uh, is, uh, is the basis of uh, the analysis that we perform for the reviews. Um, okay. It does not work. Okay. We uh, collect all this data and then we process all the data in an homogeneous way. This is also very important. As I told you, there, were, there is a panoply of different uh, pipelines, different analysis tools, and each analysis tool has a different uh, uh, particular details. If you try to uh, put together the results from different pipelines and you don't take care about the details, you may end up in inconsistencies. So if you want to really uh, narrow down these effects, the best is to apply the same tool homogeneously to all the data that you have. And that's it. What we did. I don't. I'm not going to enter in the details of a Pi 3 We gave a, a course uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, about uh, about it. Uh, so, but basically, it uh, analyzed the data in a, in a way that uh, provides with the information of the stellar population, the uh, the um, both the kinematics and the composition of the stellar population and the composition of uh, of the ionized the properties of the ionized gas, uh, spaxel to spaxel. So, in each uh, location of the data that you have uh, with a few survey that you prefer. So we uh, ingested this uh, pipeline to all the data, to this compilation, and afterwards we start to we, we started to repeat what we have been done in the last uh, uh, ten years um, on the topic on the on the uh, on the field, uh, trying to generalize the results that has been produced. Um, well, this is a, this is one example of a fitting of uh, one uh, particular spectrum. And it uh, decoupled the stellar population by uh, fitting them with a, a library of uh, single stellar populations, like if they were eigenvectors, but they are not, uh, we know that, that they are not eigenvectors, but uh, we, we treat them in, in, in a heuristic way. Um, and from there, we have the weightings of the decomposition. From this weighting, we can recover the star formation histories uh, and so on. And for the initial lines, uh, we fit them uh, with a, a set of models so we can recover the flags, the, uh, the, the velocity and, uh, and the velocity is person. So what we get out uh, when we inject that to each uh, particular data queue uh, for the stellar populations, we may have the average uh, properties. This is a luminosity, luminosity weighted, but the, you can have uh, mass weighted, uh, the dust, uh, the uh, 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 stellar metallicity, uh, sorry, the age, the stellar metallicity and the, and the dust uh, attenuation. And of course, you may have the mass uh, at different ages uh, uh, of the of the stellar population, so this look back time goes in that way. So this is now, and this is the origin of the universe, or the other way around. This is age. It, uh, this is the older, and this is the younger. From this decomposition, uh, you can uh, create the star formation history uh, of the galaxies. Uh, for the initial lines, you may have initial line maps uh, of the intensity, or the velocity, or the velocity dispersion. For different spices, and uh, in, from here you can try to recover what are the physical conditions uh, in the ionized gas at different locations within uh, the same galaxy. Okay, so before uh, doing all this analysis of, of, of all this compilation, uh, what we knew about uh, uh, galaxies, we knew a lot. You know, it's the, the but the the, the main uh, uh, the main point is that spectroscopically speaking, uh, we didn't have a, a, a global picture. Of the spatial resolve uh, spectroscopic property, but of course the integrated properties we know a lot about them. Uh, for instance, in the case of the uh, ionized gas, 
uh, we knew this is a, a BPT, the classical BPT diagram, color code by the equivalent width of, uh, uh, of H alpha uh, for the same sample uh, that I described, uh, described before. So it's, uh, it's about uh, 8,000 uh, galaxies, and each point here correspond to one single galaxy. So we are treating that like a single aperture uh, uh, of single fiber spectroscopic survey. We could have used uh, Sloan. Uh, but this one is only sampled in the very center, so this is uh, more, more generali generalized than the, the results that you can get uh, from, from Sloan. Um, and this is for all the galaxies, and then we segregate by mass. So these are the low mass galaxies. The mass is uh, uh, rising up here, and by morphology. So then each box in here corresponds to galaxies of different morphology and different masses. And this is a, a result that was new before, that basically the ionization is uh, strongly attached to the stellar mass and the morphology. If you look at the streams, these are the uh, more massive and early type galaxies, and this is the less massive and more late type galaxies. And as you can see, the distribution in the VPT diagram and the typical equivalent width are totally different. So low mass uh, uh, late type galaxies are totally associated or, or dominated by uh, ionization related to star formation, to the OB stars. And in the case of, uh, of uh, early type uh, massive galaxies, the ionization, when you see it, it's a combination of many things, but uh, most of, the, of that is most probably related with uh, post adb ionization and shocks, um, but they are not related with this star formation. So this is, and of course, the intermediate type, uh, uh, they have a combination of both, because in this kind of galaxy, you may have uh, values and this at the same time. Uh, so morphology and mass is uh, uh, totally uh, related to uh, the ionization that you can find in the galaxy. Um, the stellar populations, of course, we know we knew before. Uh, they are again each point here correspond to one single galaxy. It's totally attached to the mass and also to the morphology. So we know that there is a global uh, bimodality in galaxies. Uh, the older, uh, the, the more early types and more massive galaxies are the ones that have older stellar populations that, in the color magnitude or an age mass diagram, uh, correspond to a, an, a, a red sequence that is highlighted here. Uh, again, the color is the equivalent with phase alpha. It's going to be the same in all the plots. And as uh, you go to uh, later type galaxies, uh, this is uh, luminosity weighted. This is mass weighted. Luminosity weighted are the ones that uh, uh, spread more. Uh, the range of uh, parameters that you cover is uh, wider. Um, and for the late type galaxies, uh, uh, they are more uh, more located in this uh, blue cloud here that correspond to younger stellar populations. Uh, this by modality is totally connected with the uh, uh, location in the VPT diagram, just to show you the same galaxies. Uh, so, of course, the ionization cannot be in here produced by young stellar populations because uh, there are a uh, few uh, of those uh, young stellar populations on, on those galaxies. But they are very bright. That's why if, if you have a few star formation in the outer part, they, it will highlight a lot because this is an integrated property. Keep that in mind. Um, okay. So... Uh, this bimodality that was known uh, for uh, galaxies uh, and for the integrated properties of galaxies, it's more evident when you explore them in this uh, diagram that I showed you before, star formation versus mass. And these, these are two traces of the star formation, one based on H alpha and the other based on the analysis of the stellar population. And the galaxies that are forming stars, as I told you before, they are located in a very tight uh, relation that is known the star formation main sequence. And as you go to the uh, uh, more early type, and of course the more massive ones, they are uh, located in this, uh, and now it's a red cloud uh, that is more evident here, uh, that they are the galaxies that are not forming a star are well below uh, this star formation main, se uh, main sequence. And just to uh, uh, parenthesis, uh, optical AGNs are located in between in this location that normally is uh, named the Green Valley. These are the, the white points that uh, you may or may not see. <laughs> Depending on the projector, uh, and um, and they are they are that's why the people claim that there is a, they are in the transition phase between the star forming and uh, and the retire or point. Uh, retirement in galaxies, why galaxies halt uh, uh, their star formation is primarily associated with the lack of gas. If you don't have ingredients for forming stars, then you you don't form a star, and the galaxy uh, is out of the star formation main sequence. So this is uh, very well clear when you plot this uh, mass gas uh, that is basically molecular gas uh, versus the uh, stellar mass. Uh, again, the galaxies that form stars uh, are located in a type relation that is named the 
uh, the molecular uh, gas main sequence. And the galaxies that are not forming stars, uh, they are well below. So the primary driver or the primary association uh, uh, of, with the lack of star formation is the lack of molecular gas. And that was uh, in different articles, uh, fashion times and, and so on. So this is well known before uh, we explored with the uh, IFUs. But it's not all the picture. Because if you go to this other plot, that is the star formation rate versus the molecular gas, uh, what uh, we usually uh, find is the, the relation that we find for star forming galaxies is what we, it's usually known the Smith chemical law, chemical Smith law. So they are also located in a very tight relation that is uh, traced by this uh, uh, yellow point. And uh, you may think that the early type and, 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 and intermediate type uh, galaxies, uh, they, they are also following the same relation. But if you look in detail, and this is why this is uh, uh, this this uh, uh, yellow line is the same in the uh, three plots, you will notice that uh, as early is a galaxy, as uh, as uh, a bit below that relation uh, is the bulk of the population. So that uh, this is telling us that the star formation efficiency also plays a role in the quenching. Uh, galaxies that are quenched. Uh, or they are they are starting not to form a star in an efficient way. Um, they are not only quenched because of lack of gas. They are also less efficient forming stars. And there is a huge debate now, and uh, and I didn't update the references, but uh, you will you can see in the literature of what what came first. If it first came the lack of efficiency and then the lack of gas, or if it first came the lack of gas and then the lack of efficiency, we still don't know. Um, we knew uh, before, like uh, that, uh, that uh, we entered in the uh, IFU galaxy surveys, that the, the uh, uh, abundance, the oxygen abundance, uh, that is one of the uh, more uh, uh, frequent elements. Uh, it's uh, tight to correlated with the uh, stellar mass in galaxies, and uh, this correlation you can see only when you put all morphological types together. Because if you don't put all morphological types together, what you see is some kind of a sequence. You know, the more early type galaxies are in this regime that is basically reaching like a plateau, that is like a like a uh, a, a limit in the uh, in the enrichment, and uh, the uh, uh, late type, the more late type galaxies, they are tracing this uh, regime that is like still enriching reaching this uh, this uh, this plateau, uh, this limit. Um, okay, this relation that you can see, Tremonti, different uh, articles, and before they were in the eighties, they were pioneering the results, showing that there are there are uh, all these relations. So we knew all this about galaxies. However, um, we lack a very important uh, result that is not new at all. It's like more than one hundred years ago that Hubble uh, told us that uh, galaxies are result entities. And so this is a kind of a Hubble diagram uh, uh, for uh, using IFU data from MUSE. This is the famous or infamous. That that's not the black hole. Yeah, that's uh, saturation of the of the of the colors. This is a uh, M87 with a jet that is uh, well known. And this is an image exactly the same colors that I described before. This is an image of uh, contours, and this is an of a uh, continuum. And this is an image of the mission lines. And as you can see, there is a, a lot of rich ionized uh, structures in this galaxy, apart from the AGN and apart from the optical jet that you can see here. So, and uh, the nature of that, there is some pioneering article in 94 uh, talking about that. And this is in the archive and uh, has never been published uh, properly and explored properly the nature of that. But we have, it, obviously, it's associated with shocks. So it's a, uh, these brownish colors that the, in this color code have a lot of nitrogen, but also have uh, blue. And the combination of uh, of uh, this uh, uh, nitrogen with uh, oxygen three uh, uh, produce these uh, brownish colors. And these filamentary structures are clearly associated with uh, with, uh, with socks. They have a lot of uh, kinematic richness. Um, and as you go to more early type galaxies, uh, you may find in the center of galaxies also this brownish ionization. Uh, that is again nitrogen and oxygen is high, uh, uh, H alpha is low. This is telling us that the ionization here most probably came from OCGVs and maybe shocks. And then you have a few remnants of star formation that are these clumps 
in green, where uh, H alpha is higher than the nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and as you go to early, more early phases, this brownish structure that is associated with the bulge is reduced to the or limited to the very center, and the richness of the uh, star forming regions uh, it's uh, uh, more evident in the disks. So when you go to a galaxy without a bulge, all this structure in the disionization in the center disappears, and everything you have is a star formation. Of course, leaking of photons for this. Did you see maybe this bluish structure here? Uh, in these galaxies, it's more evident that there are leaking of photons from the uh, uh, from these two regions. You may notice also some color gradients that in here they are more greenish in the center and more bluish in the outer part. This is more evident here. Uh, in here it's more bluish and here, here it's more greenish. And this is telling us that there is a chain uh, of uh, the um, uh, properties of the uh, interstellar medium from the inside to the outside. And actually this is tracing the gradient uh, of uh, abundance uh, in these uh, galaxies. Uh, we will go later on to that, uh, but uh, it's evident uh, at, at the first uh, at the first sight with these uh, plots. So the question is that uh, why we build uh, uh, all these surveys like uh, 10 years ago and why we have been working uh, with all these data are, well, these scaling ratios that I have described you before are global and local and when they are when you uh, go to a smaller scales, they still uh, they they still behave in there in the right way in the way that we see in the global scales, or they depart from that uh, from the, this relation and at, at which scale this happens. Um, so the, the this question is still under under question, and there there is uh, some some light on that, but not it's not a close thing. Um, and what uh, uh, the uh, these uh, relations and at which scales they they start to break tell us about the evolution of, of galaxies. Or uh, for doing that, we certainly require integral field spectroscopy data. Um, keep in mind, as I told you before, that not all the surveys are the same. I insist on that. Insist on that. This is the same galaxy observed with Manga. Uh, and this is uh, observed with Khalifa. And of course, this, uh, you see, see here the gradient of colors. Uh, so here is greenish and here is bluish. No? Uh, this is telling us that there is a gradient in the oxygen abundance. This gradient you cannot see with manga because uh, you lack from the outer part. So keep that, that in mind because uh, when the people compare things, tend to forget that manga is not using the same apertures that we're using in Khalifa and they are not sampling the galaxies up to the same scales. Not to tell you about Sami, you know, this is how a galaxy is seen or not seen, by the way, is the only galaxy we have in common. Sami is uh, pointing to galaxies in the south and Khalifa to the north. So it's difficult to have uh, galaxies uh, that match in the two surveys. But uh, and uh, the light uh, is not the best for that, so we need a stronger projector or to be in a darker place. Um, so here is a brownish thing that uh, you may see or not. That is here. This is ionization by post AGBs that is associated with this elliptical galaxy. But all the outer structure of this galaxy, it's totally uh, lost uh, for some. Uh, of course, if we compare Khalifa with. Uh, uh, with Muse, we have also the effects of resolution and this pinky structure that you see here in the center that most probably is associated uh, with uh, with uh, uh, an, an outflow in the center of this galaxy. It's just hint by Calif. So it's like you have blur the image that you get uh, uh, from uh, from um, from Muse. Okay, so having that in mind, we jump to the uh, our uh, topic. Uh, one of the main conclusions we get from the interfere spectroscopy galaxy surveys is that there is no, uh, we cannot tell, um, or we cannot assign a particular ionization to a galaxy in a very, in the very naive way that has been done for ages. You know? People say this is a star forming galaxy. This is a galaxy uh, that the ionization is dominated by OB stars, or this is an, uh, an, uh, an ADN dominated uh, galaxy. Well, when you see spatially resolved, and, and this is the same colors as I showed you before, I told you before, I'm not going to repeat, but this is a, a mapping of those points in the BPT diagram with the same colors. Then you start to see things that uh, uh, make get uh, make, make can make you very confused. Uh, if you integrate uh, the spectra of uh, this uh, galaxy, and for whatever reason, you graph that area here, you made that in the conclusion that these galaxies have 
and AGM because they have a very bright supernova remnant that happens to have line ratios and intensities that are typically located in the location of an AGM. And this ha happened, especially when the supernova remnants happens in the very center of the galaxy and you graph uh, a galaxy just a very few uh, time after uh, the explosion of a, of a supernova, time in cosmological times, I mean. Okay, so you can compare uh, with uh, what is the spatial result uh, distribution for an AGN, as you can see that the location is pretty, pretty much near to that. So BPT diagram alone cannot tell you about the initiation conditions unless you uh, see the map of how this initiation is distributed in a, in a galaxy. Uh, of course, if you are, your ionization is uh, uh, due to post LGBs or uh, low velocity shocks, you may end, end up in the same location in the VPT diagram and uh, integrated in the center, you may think that this is an AGN, and, uh, but uh, with the spatial distribution uh, of uh, this uh, ionization is following the, the stellar population. It's not uh, uh, centered in the central region following like a... Uh, um, um, a square uh, um, uh, a power of uh, of of two, of two uh, decline uh, decline from the center that is uh, what you typically expect uh, from an AGN or or even sharper if if it has a dust effect. So just look it at the at the BPT diagram and especially if you co add the information, you may end up, end up in the wrong uh, conclusions. Uh, in a galaxy, you may have also post AGBs uh, that uh, that uh, are ionizing the medium. And uh, they, are, they are located in this liner-like uh, uh, location. You may have socks that are also located in this uh, liner-like location, and they may or may not be related uh, to an AGN. And of course, you may have socks associated with bipolar outflows. Here, you may see that there is a pink triangle uh, that it's uh, the kinematic is indicating that it's uh, moving out of, of uh, the plane of this galaxy, and this most probably is an outflow. Uh, associated with uh, a strong star formation in the center, and it's located in this exactly the same uh, position that is associated with the other ionizations. So this pathway can only be solved if you look to the combination of uh, of different uh, diagnostic diagrams and also the uh, uh, structure uh, that you see in the uh, uh, emission line maps. Um, all these different ionizations, in a way, have patterns. And like, uh, like we had patterns before for integrated uh, properties, for spatial result properties, now here, each point corresponds to one kiloparsec uh, in, a, in, in, a, in different uh, galaxies, uh, combining all together for all these 8,000 galaxies. And as you can see, the distribution looks similar to the integrated one. Um, the color, uh, these circles correspond to the average uh, from the center in a small size to the outer size uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, increase in the uh, the size of the, the size of the, of the of the of the of the circle correspond to uh, a larger galactic empty distance from 0 0.15 to 2.5 effective radius and again the color code is the given width of h alpha so the pattern uh, that there was highlighted or seen before that uh, more again it's uh, this is segregated by uh, morphology and by mass uh, uh, the galaxies that uh, that are um, more late type and, uh, and less massive. They are dominated uh, by the, their initiation is dominated by uh, star formation and the galaxies that are more late type, uh, more early type and more massive. The initiation, it's like a combination of uh, post AGB shocks of low velocity shocks and so on. Um, and so they are, they, they are clearly different. However, uh, you may see that the distribution is richer. So it's less concentrated in certain points. And, uh, and the patterns uh, uh, also, um, the, and the, this spread is also related to an inside out uh, chain. So in general, um, the initiation uh, connected with post AGVs and um, um, also some AGNs that are bluish in here, and they are, they are not that evident because now it's a spatial weight like at one point. Uh, so if you make the average uh, of an entire galaxy, an AGN may dominate all the initiation. But if you take into account all the points, as uh, each point is contributing to the plot, the contribution of the AGN is uh, smeared out, and it's uh, it's uh, blue from this from this plot. Uh, but they are still there. There are some blue points in here that are still uh, highlighting the presence of some AGNs. Um, 
So from the inner part to the outer part, uh, you see this trend that uh, this was uh, that compilation in more that is it's related to what we see integrated, but it is not exactly the same. For instance, um, in, in here, when you integrate uh, early type galaxies, you have some a few early type galaxies like this S0 that I showed you before that have uh, some bright star formation in the outer part. When you integrate, this star formation smear out the signal of the faint post-HDV contribution, and the average will, will be located like in here. So just a few early type galaxies with the remnants of star formation in the outer part may dominate the integrated spectrum, and, may, and, and, and you may think that this is the dominating ionization in these galaxies. But when you look at to the spatial resolved structure, uh, you see that the most of the locations in, uh, in these galaxies is dominated by ionization that have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, star formation. Just to explain you why there is this uh, blue uh, structure here. Um, on the other way, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the similar way, by the way, sorry, uh, at the more late type galaxies uh, uh, you enter in the, in the, in the statistics, uh, all these uh, areas that are correspond to the bulge is uh, some kind of blur by the presence of uh, the star formation, but here it's, uh, you see that it, it has a lot of contribution. So even the smaller portions of a galaxy where you have uh, uh, post AGB uh, stars uh, are evident, spatially resolved, and they are blurred totally uh, by the integrated uh, uh, properties. Um, we have repeated that experiment uh, in the, that I presented in the, in the review with the different surveys that we have uh, uh, published, like uh, the final uh, manga survey, and this, that is uh, an article that is uh, now published uh, uh, the, from the, the uh, extended data release of Khalifa, where we have enhanced the uh, spatial resolution. And these patterns from the inside out, they are more evident and more clearly seen when you look at in Khalifa. As I told you before, Khalifa is the best compromise we have even now, if you consider the, 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 the lack of uh, blue, uh, the blue uh, spectral range for mu's for making this kind of analysis. And the gradients are more evident in here. By the way, this gradient here, it's uh, telling you that there is a chain in the oxygen abundance. The only oxygen abundance um, traced by star forming regions is uh, higher in the center of galaxies and is lower in the outer part. So this uh, trend in here is uh, also telling you that there is a gradient in the, from inside out in the oxygen abundance. So all these we have <laughs> conceptualized in this scheme that I'm not going to enter in detail uh, because, uh, okay, so I have speaking for one hour almost. <laughs> okay, when you are bored, you you tell me to stop because it's uh, people that know me so that I can speak for hours. So um, I'm not going to explain in detail, uh, but uh, you see this uh, scheme is confusing. And the message that we want to give is that Indeed, to disentangle the ionization in a, in a, in a, even spatially resolved in a galaxy is a confusing thing, you know? So, the, so if you see that the, the plot is confusing, it's because this was the real mission. So uh, this idea that we can use just BBT diagrams uh, to uh, uh, disentangle the ionization, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a dream. You need to get back to the spatial distribution as a more simple as a galaxy, like a, like a galaxy without a bulge, uh, that is what we represent here, a very weak bulge. You have star formation regions that are clumps and they are tracing, tracing the location of uh, ACE2 regions clearly. And then you have leaking of photons that uh, basically goes in that way uh, uh, when you look uh, to uh, ionization models. But as more and more ingredients you put, like you put on top of a bulge and you put an AGN and you put alphas and so on, everything starts to be really confusing. That's uh, the message. Scaling relations. That's uh, first thing. That's I say. I was telling about the by the modality. I was telling you about the scaling relation globally. Now we have to go locally. Uh, so this is uh, the local by model distribution between the age and uh, uh, the mass. Can we reproduce that uh, uh, by modality and uh, spatially resolve? Well, well, yes. In the, in general, yes. So you you may see a different morphologies and a different uh, stellar mass uh, surface densities that the, the galaxies may have a different kind of population um, and uh, more early type and more massive uh, galaxies uh, in the more massive regions, they tend to have older stellar populations, uh, less massive galaxies or the outer regions, the regions with uh, 
lower super uh, brightness of uh, later type galaxies present uh, younger stellar populations. And the distribution also, the, it's less uh, evident this, uh, because there's a lot of smearing here. Uh, it's uh, It has two clear peaks. So yeah, it's by model. That by modality is much more evident when you explore the um, um, uh, surface density uh, of uh, the star formation rate versus the surface density of the stellar mass uh, um, of the stellar mass. Um, and for star forming galaxies, there is a tight relation. Uh, this is a, there is a lower statistic here. There's lower statistic here. But when you have a good statistic, there is a tight relation between uh, these two parameters. And this uh, relation is known as the spatial resolve or resolve star formation mean sequence. So it's a parallel of the star formation mean sequence that uh, happens uh, to, uh, it's still in place at a uh, one kiloparsec scale. It's a relation between the, as I told you, the surface density of the star formation rate versus the surface density of the stellar mass. And of course, where, when you go to early type galaxies, uh, only that they have only star formation in the, in the outer parts, uh, some of them, uh, the rest uh, are all located below this some kind of uh, cutting uh, line that is uh, equivalent with of, uh, of H alpha of three uh, that divide the, basically the star forming and the non-star forming uh, regions in galaxies. Remember that here we are not plotting, uh, and that's that's also why the, the, it's less tight because uh, the errors are larger. Um, we are plotting here structures one kiloparsec scale within uh, galaxies. For the chemical, uh, the chemical, uh, sorry, the chemical Smith Low, Smith chemical Low, uh, this was known before the came of, uh, of this kind of survey that there is a, um, a, a, a local relation. That's not a good representation. I will show you a better one later. Uh, for the um, um, uh, mass metallicity relation, there is also a local relation between the oxygen of inner surface density uh, uh, of uh, of the stellar mass that is uh, basically for um, the galaxies where you have uh, star forming regions that are the ones that you can measure uh, uh, this parameter, uh, you see that they, they, they follow the same kind of uh, relation uh, and it has a very similar shape to the relation that uh, we observe uh, globally. Um, how this global and local relation compares? Well, this is a bit, this was a bit puzzling because the global relations that I showed you before. Um, relate extensive parameters. So parameters that are integrated galaxy-wide. And the local relations, uh, they, they compare intensive parameters, parameters that are divided by the area. So how you compare the global ones with the local ones? Well, uh, in this, I follow uh, Rob's uh, article, uh, Kenny Katz article, where he basically, he had a problem of uh, measuring the distance, so the, he divided by the area in the classical article where he talked about the smith carica low uh, in, in 98. And uh, you can do the same trick. You can take any galaxy, you take this extensive uh, parameter, and you divide by the uh, area. And then you have an intensive parameter that is a characteristic parameter of the entire galaxy, but this is intensive. So when you do that, you can plot the local relations and the global relations in the same plot. And what happens when you do that? Well, in colors are the local distribution, so each point in this color map with a color representing the density uh, is a point of the sample that I showed you before. So there are uh, galaxies of different morphology. And of course, this is, these are the relations that, uh, that I were uh, describing before. The resolved star formation main sequence, the, res the, the resolved molecular gas uh, main sequence, no, the, the resolved uh, chemical uh, Smith law, uh, the resolved molecular gas main sequence, and the resolved uh, mass metallicity relation. Um, and for the star forming regions, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, type relation that I highlighted uh, you before. These are the retired regions in galaxies. And when we overplot the contours, they don't correspond to resolve the structures to one kiloparsec. They correspond to individual galaxies. So I segregate the galaxies in two streams. The ones that I know that are totally dominated by star formation, uh, the SC galaxy, and the galaxies where you may have some star formation, but yeah, they are nominated by non-star formation, as series. So, and you see the blue contours, they are located tracing exactly the location of the local relation. So when you take a global relation, you, you take a global property of a galaxy um, and an extensive parameter and you divide by the area, the intensive parameters follow exactly the same the location as uh, the uh, local relations that I uh, described you before. So, 
This, this is telling you that whatever drives this relation is a mechanism that is in place from one kiloparsec to a portion of the galaxy to an entire galaxy. And this is a bit puzzling if you think, uh, if you think it uh, carefully, okay? So we, we made that, this was a hint, and since we have this hint, we try to demonstrate it more clearly. This is uh, the global relations, exactly the same plot I showed you before, and now I selected only the star forming uh, galaxies, and I compare these star forming galaxies with the star forming regions. So the points in here correspond, these are the same relations, and we're going to explain again. Uh, each point in here, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a structure of a, uh, of the order of uh, three kiloparsec stuck it for the edge Khalifa survey that is a, a survey on Khalifa galaxies that is something CO and then we can get the molecular uh, gas and the contours correspond to either the entire Khalifa galaxy uh, with a, a tracer for the molecular gas based on the dust and in the case of apex it's just uh, an aperture of uh, 30 uh, no 28 uh, arc seconds diameter so it's uh, more or less like a one third uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the entire galaxy. Uh, and measure with a single dish with Apex, uh, actually. Uh, so they are the real uh, uh, measurements uh, of, of CO transformed to, uh, to molecular gas. And as you can see, the contours and the, and, and the yellow points are exactly in the same location. And uh, we published this, these are the different articles where these first, these, these uh, relations appear first. Um, so what we conclude, and we make also the more fine statistics, making fitting, comparing the Comoros uh, mineral test, blah, 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 no? But, uh, well, the eye is the best statistical estimate. It's obvious that they are one on top of the other. Uh, so the, it's true that the global relations, one, they are expressed in a in a intensive, uh, para, in, in terms of intensive parameters, behave exactly in the same way as the local relations. So, and this happens at any scale. Well, this is a still an open, an open question, but it seems that uh, uh, at around uh, 500 parsecs, the relation breaks. And there are very few articles addressing that. This is a very interesting one that I don't know why we don't repeat more frequently. I keep telling, but I don't have the time to repeat it because now we have a lot of data to repeat that. But this is a very nice experiment. It, uh, it, in this article, they make Maps of a, of a molecular uh, the molecular gas uh, mass density or CO, and then you have a map of the ionized gas H alpha, and uh, blue is uh, CO and red is uh, H alpha. And what they start to do is to measure from the peaks of the molecular gas. These are the blue points. They are making apertures, and they start to increase the aperture, and they measure the molecular gas content and the and the H alpha content. The ratio between these two. It's like this smith kennicott is the ratio of the two parameters in the smith kennicott uh, law. And they repeat exactly the same experiment, but they st instead of starting in the peaks of the molecular gas, they start in the peak, uh, peaks of H alpha. So they are the red points. And uh, they increase the apertures. And when they reach about one kiloparsec, then the ratio became stable. And became stable to the value that is expected from the smith kennicott law. In other words, um, this relation is only uh, can only be seen above the order of uh, one kiloparsec, uh, above the order of the biggest uh, molecular clouds that uh, we may we may find. When you go to a smaller scales, this relation does not hold, and you may see some articles from fans saying that they don't find these relations at all. Uh, and uh, I keep telling them that, that that's that's the reason, but they know. The reason for that is uh, why this is connected is in, in one of my latest articles, but uh, unfortunately I don't have time for that. I just need to finish like in four minutes. <laughs> so gradients, galaxies have gradients. The more evident uh, gradient that, uh, uh, of course the light gradient and the mass gradient was known before uh, IFU surveys, but IFU surveys uh, could measure that in a better way. And uh, especially for different uh, galaxy types, so this is the stellar mass surface uh, uh, density uh, versus the effective, the, the, um, sorry, versus the characteristic distance normalized to the effective radiate. Well, and one of the things that we have found is that when you normalize to the effective radiate, actually, as uh, Rosa keeps saying, the effective radiate is really effective. So many things that, uh, uh, that uh, can be measured at the effective radiate are characteristics of the entire galaxies. 
when you uh, normalize to the factory radiate, you can put together gases of very different sizes. If not, you could not uh, normalize and, and, and put together these uh, plots. Colors correspond to different masses, and each panel corresponds to different morphologies. We found the morphologies here. When you normalize to the factory radiate, the slope uh, of this gradient is very similar. So this means that when you don't normalize to the effective radiate, the slope is very different. So the galaxies, we know that they are more compact as they are more early type and more massive. But this is an effect of the scaling of the effective radiate that is also uh, connected to the uh, to the site of the galaxy, uh, to the mass of the galaxy. Uh, we explore the eight, um, uh, the chain of the eight uh, along the effective radiate, so along the gravitational distance. And uh, we know that the galaxies in general have all their stellar populations in the central part and in the outer part. This is uh, a, a pattern that uh, is uh, uh, present at any mass and at any morphology uh, with uh, the surface uh, or the, the older stellar population uh, being assigned to the center of the, of the more massive and more early type galaxies. There is a debate of uh, uh, E or S0 are the ones that have the older stellar population in the center. Uh, but uh, the, this pattern um, is um, is found uh, in, 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 in a morphology of any mass. Uh, however, when you measure the luminosity weighted uh, metallicity, uh, the patterns are more complicated. You have a clear gradient only for the early type uh, galaxies uh, with a decline, and especially for the more massive ones. But as you move from the more uh, massive ones to the more late, uh, late type ones, uh, you have uh, a flat distribution in metallicity or even an inversion uh, that it's uh, telling us that most of these uh, galaxies are still forming, uh, um, in chemically speaking, uh, from the outside in. Uh, for the, uh, for the uh, oxygen abundance gradient, uh, we have, of course, a lack of information when you have very late, very early type galaxies because we don't have too many star formation regions and especially in the inner path. So in here you have your suffering for low statistics. But when you have enough statistics like in here, you have a, a pattern in a way that uh, uh, when the when the stellar mass is about 9.5, the abundance gradient between 0 0.5 and 1 effective or 2 effective radii, it's uh, almost uh, similar for all the galaxies. Then you have a flutter in the central part and most probably a flutter in the outer part. And when you go to very low mass and more late type galaxies, when you have enough statistics, this uh, became in flatter and flat. So this is telling you that there are different uh, chemical enrichment histories in the very center, in the intermediate disk, and in the outer disk uh, from different uh, kinds uh, of, uh, of galaxies. Uh, more recently, we explored the alpha enhancement, and we see that the alpha enhancement also depends strongly on the morphology and the mass of, of the galaxies. Um, but in all the galaxies, especially with salt, with spatial results, there are points in different galaxies, you can recover the similar trends that we have observed in our galaxy and uh, in nearby galaxies uh, of a similar mass. Uh, finally, when you make a detailed uh, description of the mass assembly history, these are results from uh, uh, an article of uh, Ruben. No? What you find is that the center part See, this is a, this is a, a now colors correspond to different uh, galactosity distance. So the inner part is, has formed the stars uh, before and reach uh, the current mass uh, in an early time that uh, the outer part of galaxies. And this is a better measure uh, in this way. That is the uh, inner part and the outer part for different masses and for different morphologies. And this is the fraction of mass that was already formed with respect to the mass that they have now. The fraction of mass that was already formed at uh, Cita 1, that is basically 8 giga years. So the more massive and more early type galaxies in the very center have already formed most of their stellar masses uh, like 8 giga years ago. In the outer part, they are, st they are still uh, forming the stars, but they're not, uh, uh, not that much. And when you go to less massive and uh, uh, more late type galaxies, uh, then uh, you still, you, they have still not formed most of the form, like, like a 60% or 40% uh, uh, of their stellar mass uh, uh, at that time. So they start, they, they have a still forming star in the light, uh, uh, last 80 years. And in all cases, in all cases in general, um, the central part has formed the stars earlier than the, than the, 
the outer part. So this is telling us, together with the gradients that we showed you before, that in general, galaxies um, form, um, uh, grow faster from the inside uh, than from the outer, outer side. That was a concept that was uh, uncovered by Enrique. There are many people in the audience that was the local down south team. You know? So the more massive and more elite galaxies uh, uh, form faster in the center of the outer part. This led an imprint also in the metallicity. So this is uh, um, the, uh, the chemical enrichment history of how the metallicity is growing. Uh, this is a look back time at the different uh, uh, stellar masses. And this is the star formation history corresponding to the, uh, these beams in the stellar masses. And this is in the center and this is in the outer part. And metals, uh, the, the metallicity uh, go, grows faster uh, and in more early periods in uh, cosmological time uh, for more massive galaxies than uh, than current uh, the, the, the the low the less massive are still currently forming uh, metals and this uh, metallicity enrichment has happens faster in the central part than in and slower in the outer part and by the way the, the outer part of uh, of galaxies they are look more similar between different galaxies that the, that the center. Uh, and the distinction of galaxies happens more in the center or in the outer part. Um, well, um, this is also reflected in the uh, uh, star formation rate, the current star formation rate. Um, if you normalize by the effective ready, by the way, the star formation rate in all galaxies looks it, it respectfully of the of the of the mass. It looks very very similar, but it's puzzling. But it does not look uh, similar at all is the specific star formation rate. Uh, more massive uh, uh, galaxies um, form stars before, but they are not forming stars now. And actually, uh, there is a, 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 a rise of the star formation rate from the center to the outer part, or if you interpret it the other way around, a decline to the center that was uncovered in an article by, uh, by Rosa. Uh, so the, the set, it's not only that the galaxies um, grow from the inside out, also quench from the inside out, okay? And this quenching, it's related with the lack of gas, but also with the change in the uh, efficiency. Uh, when you uh, plot the efficiency, the star formation efficiency of different radii, the star formation efficiency of more massive galaxies is much lower than the star formation efficiency of less massive galaxies. That Remember that hint that I told you before when we saw the integrated properties? That the star, the star, the Smith chemical law have some kind of a, a separation by uh, star formation by, by morphology and mass. In the case of uh, of uh, of uh, 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 the radial gradients, this uh, uh, chain is uh, more evident. So whatever happens in galaxies to stop uh, forming stars, um, the lack of gas is not enough, or is not telling all the picture. So now I'm going to finish. With some kind of this is a compendium. What I say, what I there are other results. I left many things out, the contribution of many people out, but uh, it's uh, impossible to make uh, that in one single talk. Um, but uh, we have a lot of future, and the future I have tried to outline me here, uh, outline me here in different points. One is going to higher spectral resolution, higher spatial resolution, the connection of. When this uh, scaling relation, when these all these patterns that I have uh, telling you uh, start to break, and why uh, that uh, in, in general have it's related to uh, to feedback, to local feedback, but I don't have time to explain. Uh, this uh, requires that we explore galaxies with a, a more a more detailed, uh, a better physical spatial resolution. So this is the two example. This is fans. Uh, so. This is uh, M74 for NGC 628 that, uh, that by the way, was uh, uh, the PhD thesis of one colleague of us, uh, uh, Fabian Rosales Ortega, no? and also the PhD of uh, Rob Kenica, who's focused on that article. So it's a kind of a scanning and back, and now it's uh, one of the uh, uh, big uh, hits of uh, hints of uh, hits of, uh, of, of funds. Um, this is an, uh, uh, the resolution we are getting with the local volume mapper. This is the center of the Rosetta. Uh, and I will talk about the local volume mapper next week. So I'm not going to tell too much, but it's, the idea is to go to a smaller scale. Uh, multi wellness information. Uh, we need the information from H1, how to H1 transform to H2, 
Uh, the connection with kinematics is still missing. Uh, how other wellness like ultraviolet or, or far infrared uh, can give us uh, further information. Of course, we need to go to higher uh, recipe, and that's that's not it's not the future actually because it's, it's even the present uh, uh, what's going on. But we also need we don't we don't we don't need to forget that most of the things we have done with the, this uh, integral physical capability surveys was based with the techniques where we have at the moment. And we need to improve the, the, the techniques because we have learned in the in the meantime how to extract more and richer information. Just uh, putting you an example of something that we get out uh, quite recently. This was the resolution uh, uh, that we have in the maps of Khalifa, the same kind of color maps that I saw you before you continue uh, in the last uh, data release, official data release of, of Khalifa. And then using different techniques. This is uh, the resolution we can achieve, or we have achieved actually, uh, uh, implementing a new resolution scheme, new reconstruction image schemes. And you can see the richness, and this is an image of the Sloan. So we almost reach uh, the uh, natural scene uh, resolution. What was, if you have told me like uh, 15 years ago, I would will, I will have said that it's impossible, uh, but, uh, uh, People that are more intelligent than me already told me that uh, we were doing things in a crap way. So all these reconstruction images, I'm going to give credit. Thanks for a discussion we have with Michael Blunt, Michael Blunt, that after a talk we gave him, there was on, on manga. He said that we are reconstructing images in a stupid way. We need to find a better way. This this cannot be the best we can do. And he told me about the sampling theory and so on. It was back in my head, and it was very uncomfortable about that because it was the the father of this reconstruction scheme until I finish uh, finding this this thing and I still not uh, believing too much in my own results by the way. Uh, conclusions. Uh, I think interactive gases will have improved our understanding of physical processes that shape galaxies. Ionization is a local process have to be explored in a local way. Um, uh, integrated average uh, uh, properties uh, of galaxies can basically destroy the information of uh, what is going on in terms of uh, ionized gas. And the same happens uh, with uh, with the uh, stellar populations. And we need to, to understand the initiation. You need to understand not only the initial lines, you need to go to the underlying stellar population and you need to uh, go to the kinematics and you need to go to the shape uh, to basically uh, uncover the real nature of the initiation. The evolution of galaxies seems to be uh, ruled by local relations that uh, that uh, generate the radial gradients. All radial gradients are the outcome of the connection between these uh, parameters. I even said that explicitly, and uh, they seem to be totally connected with the global integrated uh, relations that uh, we see in galaxies and we have seen in galaxies for decades. Um, so, what rule these local relations? Still not clear. We have learned the galaxies grow inside out. And we also have learned that the galaxies quench inside out. And I think we still don't know why galaxies galaxy quenches. And I'm totally against uh, the mainstream of invoking uh, like a monster that blow all the gas or heat it, and that's all. When you go to hydrodynamical simulations and you compare with real data in detail, um, I'm proud to be a colleague of uh, Jaguas Casiva that is always uh, digging into that. And, uh, and his students and now colleagues. Um, the way that the, the, the galaxies die in, uh, in the hydrodynamical simulations, we know it's wrong, so it should, should change. So I think that we still don't know why galaxies went in, and that that's a very important thing, a different scale. So we don't know why the, these relations that I told you before emerge. We don't know why galaxy went in, and, and and all these two things are connected with feedback. So why I say that, next week I'm going to talk about feedback. So I connect this talk with the rest, the other one, and well, I overpassed the hour. You are not asleep. So good coffee. <laughs> That's all. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so as you, you're talking about things that you're going to 
analyzed when you consider just one kinematic of components in your emission balance, right? So what about what about considering when you have several components and they're mixing everything? Well, um, yes, <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, there is a problem here. I, I the problem when you start to have different uh, different kinematic components is that the interpretation of that kinematic components became more and more complex. So you either extract non-parametric uh, non uh, you make non-parametric fittings or make non-parametric derivations like the asymmetry index or things like that that are very efficient. And uh, this was very efficient, for example, the PhD of uh, Carlos Lopez, who did that for the emission sample to uncover outflows and uh, distinguish them from AGNs and other kind of emission. That was a very interesting thing. But when you start to feed with multiple components, normally you end up in a, the, the analysis, and then the understanding of these analysis start to become really very complex. Uh, so I point you to a presentation that I think is public of uh, Bert Kuzma, a former student and marvelous colleague, that uh, that uh, uh, made a presentation just as early on that on the EAS in Lyon, 2019. And he start to play with the components and say, as, as better you feed the, the spectra, as less ability you have to understand what that is feeding. So, my, so just to answer you, my approach is first to make the things simple and then start to complicate, but the stop at a certain moment is you want to recover exactly the spectra that goes, you know, the model that goes to all the initial lines. You must probably end up in something that you cannot interpret in an easy way or not, or not cannot interpret at all. So one, two, three components, okay. If you put 20 components, the fitting will be perfect. It will be perfect also with the Taylor, uh, you know, an SP line, uh, but the information um, will become complex. Of course, but for, for those in which you have detected that the presence of, let's say, two, three components is important, um, does it have an effect of considering not considering that when you when you go into the relation to the right block? All, all the relations I did in here, they, we use a non-parametric extraction that is based on like a moment analysis, a weighted moment analysis. So they are not going to be affected uh, that much. But if you want to go to the detail, for example, in the case of shocks or particular gases, yes, of course, you need to you need to make a, a, a yeah, they have an effect. And, and decoupling that will clean, uh, it will not uh, change the global patterns that are totally dominated by, by the monsters, the star formation, I mean, not star formation, the stellar component in general, and the star component plus the AGN, this will dominate uh, almost all the patterns. And then all these details that they show you, the supernova remnants and, uh, and shocks and all these kind of things, uh, then you need uh, several components. And uh, the interpretation is uh, more detailed. That what I uh, uh, try to outline here. Yes, you are right. That's it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, you blow my mind at all this uh, hard work and very impressive work for the last. Uh, uh, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> I could be scared. Okay. Amazing. You confusingly, confusingly have shared a lot of life in the. Uh, property we thought we knew of galaxies uh, from the long closer scale to the large scale. Uh, so, if, if I understand what you said in the last few uh, slides, uh, the two, because I was going to ask you, do you think it really is the challenge? But I think what we did, what we did best, what you just mentioned, uh, Two main points to, to understand is quenching at the last game, uh, and then at the, uh, how this uh, uh, relationship emerge at the slow at uh, the local scale. Now, uh, with the local volume mapper data, uh, you're going to address, I guess, the, how this relationship uh, uh, emerges at the lower scale. I hope at the local scale. And then I'd like to connect with the, what Isabel just mentioned. You're going to have now, uh, when you to analyze this data, as the best of the data for the local lab, 30 people out of the sample, which is very complex. Um, you're going to have to really get 
uh, into the nitty gritty the details of all these uh, investing for kinematics and analysis. Um, I don't know if you comment. Well, I, 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 I think I think that those who embarked in the local volume market, we were too naive. We came most of the people that, that, that is in there, the people that are more expert and they know better, uh, they they keep saying that, that there was a complex thing. But we came from galaxies and those who work in galaxies, you know, stars came by millions. You know, we are like sociologists of stars, you know, and and uh, and everything is is blur under the the averaging thing, you know, and and now we are entering in a dilemma, you no, know? because now that I see to the data, the, the complexity is really enormous. Uh, so, giving you a short answer and by the approach that I outlined it before, there will be some kind of a first pass through the data where we just integrate it in the brute way, like a narrow bands, you know, moment is something like that. And then there will be a lot of refining and refining and refining. But even when we extract all this information, the interpretation of that information is going to be really bad. So how the, the people that make uh, uh, photonization models and they create uh, these uh, 3D uh, models, uh, they, they will need to uh, to basically create mocks of what we are seeing to understand that. So there will be different levels of understanding uh, of, of the data. I don't know if this is answering you, uh, but uh, but it's it's really well, it takes for it's going to take for ages, uh, lo longer than what I, we anticipated. I think by the manpower we have, but I think the data are so so good even. Passing this brute uh, analysis that we are doing there, that uh, I think we are going to encourage more people to really go into the data and and try to replicate what they are seeing. But uh, yeah, I not I not very much worried because uh, time is all we have. No, so I mean I don't have a deadline. We have the deadline for 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 building the instrument and for putting in place, and we see you know slowing consortium breathing in our neck, you no. Know? But now the data are there; they will be there for a long time. I don't know if this answers your question. I'm partially scared. I'm partially okay. Don't care. It's a question of time. I. Uh, then you several questions. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see you again. Uh, some of the problems that you are posing here about the multi components in multi galaxies are very similar to what we find in the Nibiru when we observe those with IFS. Great instruments, lots of data to reach uh, complexity. We found that using uh, 3D visualization tools or the multi dimensional visualization tools. Helps a lot in disentangling different components. So I wonder whether these tools exist. Whether this kind of analysis are already we are using us. We have we have different tools, but uh, uh, we are still uh, for galaxies. Uh, we never. I, I tried to push that. I mean, the people that uh, that is in the audience they have seen in my presentation, early presentation, these kind of tubes. Uh, and try to see, and you see, for example, jets are clearly seen and things like that, but uh, it didn't crystallize really into the audience, you know? So at the end, the people want, you know, to collapse the things in 2D. I don't know, it's a question of brain. Get, you get you don't want people working on that? No, we don't have, well. We do have the area, the area great. working on, on, on visualization of 3D data. Perfect. They are welcome. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, to, to go in that line would be great. To get, get back to that line would be great. So, yeah, I, I have not, I have, um, now I have more fundamental problems, like uh, how to subscribe this guy in the local volume market. Mm -hmm. I am still not at that level of, of, of details uh, that you are telling me, but uh, you're welcome. If you have an idea, if you have people that are working on that, I think uh, we will be more than happy, and I will be more than happy to 
to talk with them and see what, what we can get out of that. But I'm still very far behind that in this moment. Okay, there is another question in the chat. Yeah, I'm Modena. You can. I'm Modena, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. Thank. Uh, impressive work. Um, I just want to mention uh, that this large scale laws or relations um, are very impressive, always impress me. But I study a parsec scale star formation in galaxies. And I can say that these laws do not happen, do not apply. You mentioned a little bit before, but I think it's really puzzling for me because I understand the large scale uh, relations, but when you go to the real size where star formation happen, a few parsecs, stellar clusters is what we do. And by the way, this is not the future. We are doing this a number of years in the parsec project, now more recently with funds. Even they do a hundred parsecs is too much because clusters happen a few tens of parsecs or less. Then things become very different. And just briefly want to, to mention, because this will help all to understand uh, all together, maybe. Um, H-alpha might not become a best tracer of star formation because we see many star forming regions at cluster scale where the H-alpha has been leaked. It's gone, so you will miss them. Because we see star formation at cluster scale, we see them, we know the mass where the star formation has happened. So the star formation efficiency can change dramatically when you measure a kiloparsec scale, simply because the mass you integrate is much more than what is really used for star formation. There is many space in between. You, know, you want, you have a huge, uh, very uh, feeling factor, the useful feeling factor we use in astronomy is very tiny. Equally for a star formation surface brightness, because you uh, so, uh, rate over an area which is much bigger than the region it is. Equally for ages, because when you study a star formation, you study cluster by cluster, a region by in the in your cloud. Uh, they are different ages and not separating by a few million years, maybe by million years. We can date every cluster in the region. And even for molecular cloud as well, because many times, most of the times actually, the molecular cloud, the star forming region we are seeing is gone, is used somewhere else. You see more gas, more molecular, but somewhere else. Maybe it's the precursors, we see those as well, clouds, but the, pre, the new, coming and start forming regions. So it's a little bit passing, it's complex. Um, I always try to see how to connect with a large scale. It's, it's really difficult, but I try, definitely. But I can add a, a one thing, is that something we are learning when we are studying this at these scales is that there is inflow gas. There is always gas, regardless of even the morphology of the galaxy we study from the outer part of the galaxies to the regions where we see the star formation. And this must be the, the feeding of the reservoir of material, which is eventually, depending on what mechanism trigger star formation, I agree with you that it's not only to have the gas, there is something else as well um, that make the clouds that we see a parsec scales, again, not a, a few hundred passes or kilo passes. this is too big, a molecular cloud, parsec scale and um, collapse. So um, I, I just add this because it's like a different view. It should be probably mass connected, but there is an additional information, which is the inflow material streamers, we call filaments, we fall in dust and in gas that come in general from outer part of the galaxies or from even the intergalactic medium. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, I know. If, I mean, there was not a real question, but uh, I I don't want. I don't know if you want me to comment on that or or um, that. I mean, I'm totally aware that uh, at lower scale the relations they don't they don't work. I I I the puzzling is why why there are at a higher scale. But I totally agree with you, and I think part of the problem is that you have uh, you have uh, passed through it, but it's uh, very important. Is that this simple interpretation that the Smith did and then then then, then Kennicott uh, took later 
that uh, that uh, it's connecting in a, a, a molecular a molecular cloud that is not existing anymore with the present star that we see. This is this is this was the error. So we keep that all the time in mind, and uh, the molecular clouds that we measure are not the the gas that is in the star. The gas that is in the star have already consumed that molecular cloud. Uh, and so the connection kind of being there. Um, so I didn't want to enter on that because it's a complete entire talk, but the uh, inflow, outflow, and particular feedback, it's uh, it's the line to go. The the reason for this, uh, for this uh, is for you are already large scale because kiloparsec, it's a, it's a very large, uh, you compare to the size of Orion. Um, uh, this this relation has to emerge due to other reasons. It cannot be just by a simply adding and zooming of, uh, of of mass. That I think we agree on that. I mean, I I don't see a big problem on that. I said before that we were we were uh, approaching to that uh, thinking of stars like millions of them, uh, tens of me of, of thousands, and now individual stars are are, are are annoying, <laughs> and but we need to take care of them. You know. So I totally agree. And one of the big problems is that we don't communicate. I think I told in, the, in my talk in, uh, in Ensenada, no? like a couple of months or three months or four months ago, I don't remember, I cannot remember, it was uh, before Christmas, no? Uh, I, I told that we don't communicate. There are two communities that are working for two different approaches. And, and now we need to start communicating because to understand what we see at high, a large scale, we need to go to small scale. And to understand what is happening at low scale, you need to go to large scale because you cannot describe what happened at the, that scale you're working without understanding why these at the end, these puzzling, these individual monsters uh, need to be connected to the larger scale. And the relations should, should emerge. So yeah, totally agree. I don't have a problem with that. That means that we need to work more. They pay for us for doing that. So I don't care. Good, good for you. Yeah. Okay, the final question, please. Go ahead. So it's about the age maps that you showed. Uh, so I assume uh, you calculated using the self emission uh, process, but do you use like the H alpha or uh, do you use uh, like a non parametric self emission where you divide it into eight things to calculate the age? Uh, we make uh, the composition uh, with uh, different uh, single star populations. So you assign a certain amount of light to a certain uh, population. And then you may assign a certain mass to a certain population with a certain age. And from that, you can derive the luminosity weighted age. That is the first moment of the age uh, distribution function. Okay, what you get with this, the composition is an age distribution function, a metal distribution function, and the average weighted by, by light is, uh, this is the luminosity weighted. So indeed, I just said, because I, I took some slides out, it's more interesting to explore the, the, all the age uh, distribution and all the metal distribution, it gives you more information than just one single value. Average um, um, may not tell you all the, uh, all, all the information, but that's that's the way we do that. So it's an equation, you know, zoom the weighted by light times the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the age, and that's all. Yeah, because you can also calculate it using uh, like when you fit the spectra, you can uh, order like a non-parametric uh, where you divide the star formation into different eight bins. Uh, yeah, you can. And uh, so no, my my curiosity was if you do one way or the other, and if what the happens? Would okay, be compatible or uh... well, there are some there are some studies that where we do that, but we didn't uh, explore the age exactly. Uh, but uh, well, but there are some uh, some explanations that with Sakis, for example, we explore the star formation rate that you get at the end with the, these two different approaches and. Uh, it maps uh, pretty well when you have enough signal, and it doesn't work when you don't have signal. What well, is not was not uh, very surprising, uh, by the way. The match was recovered pretty well, uh, but the age, in particular age, uh, we didn't do. But if you get the right star formation rate and you get the right mass, uh, I figure out that uh, apart from the scaling, you you will have a very reasonable number. 
uh, comparing both. But I told you the multi frequency is also important, and uh, that, that we still have all the all the complete picture. Okay, so remember that Cynthia will be here until the next week, the end of the next week. Also, in fact, the next uh, Thursday, also be the seminar related with the, with the annual interesting project, the local volume mapper. Um, now, today, uh, we can join the hall if you want to come to have lunch with Sebastian. Okay, thank you, Sebastian, for the talk. It's it's very great to know that you stay here at the AMA. Um, I'm quite happy for this seminar because they also put in context the beautiful work that we have done in Khalifa for the rest of the community. So thank you a lot. Well, thanks to you for inviting me. That's it. Pues te vi el otro día pasando por el pasillo, sí, pero, chiu, chiu. pero rápido. Claro. Espérate claro. que me desconecte de aquí. No me no acuerdo quedar hoy para pues, la comida, pero buscamos algún día para tomar un café. Sí, sí por favor. Sí, claro. Hablamos de esto. Y tienes, tienes toda la razón. O sea, tenemos...